It is good to see everyone here this evening. I am glad to see Tom Belzer with us this evening. I hear that Marie is doing well, but not uh, really up to getting out and about to be here tonight. So keep Marie in your prayers. And um, as we get started, um, one, well, kind of a twofold announcement on one topic. Um, closed closet set up is tomorrow night at 630. If you can be here at 630 to help with the setup tonight, we need to move tables and chairs. So immediately after Bible study and uh, devotional, after the last amen, so to speak, um, Chloe needs some help in the fellowship hall, rearranging the tables and the chairs to get set up for closed closet. And then closed closet setup is tomorrow night at 630. Did I get that information out right? Okay. Um, before we get started, um, are there prayer concerns that we need to mention? I know that Samantha and family are going to be traveling. Um, she is having a, is it annual or every, annual uh, checkup on hearing at MUSC. So we want to keep them in our prayers as they are traveling on Sunday for an appointment on Monday. Okay, I got it right. So they're going to be traveling... Um, I make these notes, so Trish and I both have the notes. Um, also, uh, my wife Jennifer and Beth Carroll are traveling. Um, they got to Nome, North Dakota at uh, about 3.30 our time. And um, if you've ever heard my wife talk about uh, air travel, she is not a fan in any way, shape, or form. And as they were sitting on the tarmac in Greenville, the pilot came on and said, well, folks, just get ready for some real turbulence. <laughs> and um, apparently the second flight was worse than the first flight. <laughs> so there was a, a shout of joy once they landed in uh, North Dakota, uh, but they will be there and they're traveling back on Sunday. So keep them in your prayers as they are away. What other concerns do we need to mention? Joe? Okay. So Christy is at home sick. Uh, Michael Grooms is either in or finishing up with surgery at this point. Tom? Our great grandbaby and granddaughter are both back in the regular room tonight. Okay. In Russia. Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay. She's from Russia. And I probably can't pronounce his last name, so I can even ask. <laughs> even if you could pronounce it, there won't be a chance that I could spell it. As I look at VIC, I figure it's probably VIK if he is Russian. So um, uh, I think we've we've got enough with Victor. I think so. All right. What else? K Cash. K Cash. Yes, uh, we got uh, a message the other night that Virgie's son uh, passed away in the Philippines. Um, I think there will be more information on that later um, this evening in the, the full announcements. Uh, but Virgie is looking to travel back to the Philippines for his memorial. Uh, if I understand, he was rather young, 46. Uh, 46. So he passed away in the Philippines, and Virgie is trying to get back. I believe the memorial service is uh, early next week. 
Um, so keep her in your prayers. And like I said, there'll be another announcement about that uh, in a little bit. And you know Virgie's daughter here has been battling cancer, having a really bad time for months. Okay. Just a, a quick side note, Virgie first visited us when the carpet was being replaced and we had postponed services in person. Uh, we did the live stream for Wednesday night, uh, but Virgie and two other people visiting showed up and um, there were a couple of, of pews that were not out of order at the very back. Um, so that's when we first met Virgie and had a, an opportunity to talk with her quite a bit. So uh, let's keep her um, in our prayers as well as her daughter as she deals with, uh, with cancer. Anything else? All right, let's begin with prayer. Almighty God, our Father in heaven, we come before you now, humble, thankful, and in awe of you. Father, we, we say it sometimes, and it's important to understand what we say when we talk about the fragility of life and the temporary nature of our walk here. We pray, Father, that you will help us keep that in mind in a healthy way, in a way to strengthen our dependence on you and our focus on your word, our reliance on the promises that you have made, and our desire to be more in line with your will. Tonight, especially, Father, we bring a number of names to you, a number that we have concern for, Father, and want to ask your healing, your care, your guidance, and your comfort for. We ask that you watch over the Woodward family as they travel, pray for a good report on the checkup, and further strength for Samantha in this time. We ask that you will watch over Christy as she is at home sick. Father, we pray that you will heal her. We're so thankful for her example and her encouragement, and we pray that you will return her to us quickly. Father, especially now we come before you on behalf of Michael Grooms. Father, we know the work, we know his desire to serve you, and we know the physical challenges that he faces. We ask that you will strengthen him through this surgery. We ask that you will give him a better measure of health, relieve some of the pain that he endures, and give him the ability to return quickly to a course of work. Father, we're thankful for the news on Marie Belzer, and we're thankful, Father, for uh, the granddaughter and the baby's return. We pray that you will strengthen them, that you will heal them, and, and guide those that watch over and care for them. Father, we ask for your care on behalf of Victor. We ask, Father, that you will help us, even over long distances, find ways to encourage to build up and to serve those that are in need. We pray for Kay Cash. We pray for Virgie in all of the challenges that she is facing. We pray for comfort in the passing of her son and comfort and, and encouragement for his family. We ask, Father, that you watch over Virgie's daughter, heal her as she battles with cancer. And Father, please use us Give us the, the desire to serve. Give us the desire to encourage and to know each other deeply enough that we can serve truly in all matters of need, in all matters uh, of discomfort, in all of the things that we face in this life. Help us to encourage one another, strengthen one another, and be there for each other. Father, we're so thankful for your son, Jesus Christ, and we approach you in his holy name with all of these requests. Amen. Okay, so assuming that my right hand, uh, which is this little iPad sitting here, does not continue to act up, uh, we're going to try to get through. Um, okay, that's, a, that's really uh, optimistic. Uh, we're going to cover some more of Isaiah 10 tonight. Uh, we talked about Isaiah 10, the first few verses being a continuation of what was being said, uh, basically through uh, verse 4. And then we got into Assyria as an instrument. So let's begin Isaiah chapter 10, beginning in verse 5. Woe to Assyria, the rod of my anger, 
and the staff in whose hand is my indignation. I will send him against an ungodly nation and against the people of my wrath. I will give him charge to seize the spoil, to take the prey, and to tread them down like the mire of the street. So we talked last time about Assyria identified as the instrument of what? It's on the slide if you need a little tutor there. God's wrath. Appreciate Bob reading that for us. Assyria is the instrument of God's wrath. What does that mean? God is allowing Assyria to mete out the punishment that Judah has brought on themselves. That ordering of words is a, a, an important distinction to understand. Okay? Because it is not as if this is random. It's not as if, oh, one day Assyria just decided that they're going to take over pretty much the world as it was known at that time. This is a matter of Judah should have known better. Judah was warned. Judah has been told. Judah rebelled. Judah rebelled a little more. And Ahaz went so far as to go to Assyria and say, Hey, look, my neighbors are talking about war. Will you form an alliance with me? Now, obviously Martin is paraphrasing. But that's in general what we're talking about. Assyria is God's instrument for punishing Ephraim and Judah, Israel, northern kingdom, and Judah, southern kingdom, all of Israel. But it's important to understand that later on, and we can read about it in Habakkuk, Babylon will overrun Assyria, and in the process, they will take the Jews captive. Sometimes we talk about Babylonian captivity. Well, understand that in some cases... The biblical account is about God's people, but there are also unrecorded aspects going on at the same time, or sometimes details that are recorded only mildly. We need to understand that when Babylon takes Judah, takes Israel into captivity, it's not just Israel. It's large portions of the world at that time. So Assyria will fall to Babylon, and then Babylon, Isaiah 13 talks about this, Babylon will fall to the Medes, and then the Medes, talked about in Daniel 8, will fall to the Macedonians. Why do I go into this detail? What does it matter? I, you know, there may be a lot of times when Martin's running on and on about things, you go, why is he talking about all this? There is a, 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 a reason Part of the reason is when we look at world history and when we look at the Bible, we continue, when we're looking at facts with an honest heart, we continue to find that the world around us confirms what the Bible says. As archaeology progresses in an honest academic pursuit, we will find archaeology confirming Scripture. Why does that matter? It, the true. It, it proves the Bible's true. Now, here's a trick question. So you've got to think about this one a minute. Do we need it to prove it? No. So what's, and I, that's not an argumentative point. What's the value of archaeology proving the Bible? You know, it's always really nice to firmly believe something within the context of the belief. Here's what I mean. It is, it's encouraging to believe the Word of God because within the Word, we can't find contradictions. We can find things that look like contradictions, and then when we study through them, we realize that's not a contradiction. But it's really nice to have a faith in that Word and then see things apparently unrelated that fully confirm it. Excavation at the Sphinx, you know, that you know, man-headed lion near the, um, uh, the pyramids in Giza. Excavation around that suggests at one point there was some sort of massive flood in the region. Okay? More investigation into that is saying, okay, this was not just some flood, it was 
the flood. So I bring out these points for a couple of reasons. Number one, people will try to use secular knowledge to defeat Scripture. The only time when that has the appearance of success is when that secular knowledge is wrong. Now, it may take decades, it may take quarter centuries, half centuries for any scientist to acknowledge, oh yeah, that thing we said 25 years ago, we were wrong and it really actually coincides. But where, especially where we find it in Scripture referring to this progression, how the land was taken over, I think it's important to look at because all of those examples that I put on the slide, and just in case you, you don't know, I point back here because we're both seeing the same thing, just in opposite directions. So what you're seeing here is in Scripture, but we can also find secular historical records that confirm that progression of captivity, of being overrun, of having nations that are running that part of the world. That's important for us to understand because as we get into deeper discussions with those outside the church, in some cases outside of any kind of faith, this can be an interesting point at which to start. I've had individuals that will talk about history that want nothing to do with a conversation about faith. Well, let's talk history. Patrick? Well, I've heard people say that you know, your faith wouldn't be faith if you had any facts to back anything up. But that's just not true. <laughs> right. And not just that, but the Bible feels history on its own is important. Yes. Even without the religious and the faith products of it. But the Bible fills in parts that our history is flawed in. And many archaeologists use the Bible to discover the ancient world. I have read an article once where an archaeologist at some point or another said that any archaeologist who doesn't use the Bible to look for the ancient world is a fool. Yes. Well, you know, we use the phrase, those who do not learn from history are doomed to repeat it. Could we take that saying and overlay that on the nation of Israel? Because they repeat the same cycle of evil, sinfulness, rebellion, over and over and over. And I was going to say, Judges, you know, is a, a, an encapsulation of that concept. And I suspect if, if we needed a scholarly pursuit, Marshall, couldn't we sit down and probably count the number of times that that cycle repeats itself in the Old Testament? If they had learned from their history, would things have been different? I'd like to think so. I'd like to think maybe we can learn from that. Joe? In, in John 20, um, Thomas doubted, unless he saw the hands of Jesus, he said, I will not believe. And then it later says that those that have not seen him believe are, are blessed. Because of, but it's human nature to doubt it. But yes. confirmation always helps. It does. It does. And, you know, for me, a lot of times it's a matter of, especially early on, when I was a, a very immature Christian, one of my thoughts was, wow, if, if only I could have seen one of those miracles. And then as I started a broader study of God's Word and thought, you know what, they saw those miracles, but they didn't have anything written down that happened after that. They got to witness it, but we've got the totality of what happened for our sakes. And they still didn't believe, they, they still didn't believe seeing the miracles. You know, they asked for signs, and signs had already been given, right? That's what I was getting ready to say. They had all the miracles, and they still killed Jesus. Yes. Yep. All the signs were there to prove time and time again who he was and what he could do, and they still sent him to the Right. Right. And, you know, that, that is a very important message for us. Are we going to see a miracle face-to-face? -face? No, we are not. Okay. arguments that I hear a lot. Well, if God would actually talk to me, I would know what to do. And I said, well, he talked to the Israelites all the time. And they kept over and over and over again not doing what he said. Oh, yeah. When he was talking directly to them, I said, but he does talk to us. It's all right here. Right. I was going to say, we've got all he's ever going to say about what we need to know. And the other aspect, not to get 
completely off the, the, the text for tonight. The other aspect is God's providence as well. Because that is a, an important aspect. I think at some point, we're either going to do a series of, of sermons or maybe even a class. I'll talk to Brian about it. Brian's probably tired of hearing all of my ideas for classes. But um, I'll step up when I give you an idea, Brian. Um, but I, I think it's important for us to, to consider the fact that we've got this external confirmation of God's internal framework. Okay? It talks in Scripture about those, that series of captivity and overrunning of various nations. And then when we look at a secular bit of information, we find confirmation there. So, like Joe said, sometimes it's nice to have the confirmation because it strengthens what we have already decided is truth because it's been presented in God's Word. Okay? All right, let's look at verse 7. Yet he does not mean so, nor does his heart think so, but it is in his heart to destroy and cut off not a few nations. Okay, so understand, verses 5 and 6 are, you know, basically Isaiah sharing what God has said. Woe to Assyria. Here's what I'm going to let Assyria do. Now here's the but that's involved. Verse 7, yet he does not mean so. Who is the he in this passage? The he is Assyria. Or the, the head of Assyria. Okay? But in general, it's referring to the nation, the empire of Assyria. Okay? It's not Assyria's plan to serve God. And that's what this is saying. He doesn't mean to be the rod of God's anger. His heart does not think that he's serving because in his heart is the idea to cut off nations. And that passage, cut off not a few nations. Do you understand what that is saying his intent is? What's Assyria's intent? We talked about this three or four lessons back. They want to conquer the world. They want to be the empire. They want to be the richest, the most powerful, the most feared. And they're going to go on and talk about how Assyria brags about itself. And we'll look at that in just a minute. So, it's not Assyria's plan to serve God. God is not saying, I am going to, in my almighty power, pick up your army, put it in the midst of Judah, and conduct their actions miraculously. This is a use through God's providence. They are going to take over all of what we would think of as Israel. Okay? Let's keep going. So, in verse 8, we find, For he says, Are not my princes altogether kings? Is not Kauno like Carchemish? Is not Hamath like Arpad? Is not Samaria, Samaria like Damascus? As my hand has found the kingdoms of the idols whose carved images excelled those of Jerusalem and Samaria, as I have done to Samaria and her idols, shall I not do also to Jerusalem and her idols? What is that talking about? Do you understand that what Isaiah is conveying is Assyria's boasting? When it says in the second line, are not my princes altogether kings? Archaeological research has shown through readable records that in the Assyrian Empire, the highest military authorities were the kings that Assyria had conquered from other nations. So as Assyria sought to take over the world, when they took over a country and their leader would play the game, 
That leader was made a military, our equivalent of a general. So what Assyria is saying is, aren't our military leaders the former kings of nations that fell to us? Do you see the power of that boast in a physical world standpoint? They're saying, hey, look, world, we don't just have soldiers. We've got kings as soldiers and princes. When he talks about Kauno and Carchemish and Hamath and Arpad and Samaria and Damascus, what he is saying is all of these are, have, fallen toward, have fallen before us. Why would your cities, why would your capitals be any different? So this is an empire saying, we are mighty, we are the mightiest there is. And then in verse 10, it says, As my hands have found the kingdoms of the idols, whose carved images excelled those of Jerusalem and Samaria. What is he saying? This requires a little bit of an understanding of Eastern religions. What this is saying has to do with the way that truly idolatrous nations looked at their gods. Little g, gods. As a, a empire like Assyria assumed and overcame other lands, they were prone to adopt into their religion the little g gods of the countries they conquered. But because they had conquered them, these were lesser gods. Because it reinforced Assyria's power to say that our idols are more powerful than yours. They kept them as symbols that they were lesser than the Assyrians. So part of what this boast is saying is we went, we found your gods, and we excelled over them. And, by the way, Jerusalem and Judah and Samaria, the gods that we've already conquered are greater than your gods. And that's still a little G God, because by this point, Israel has abandoned the big G God. They've set up idols that they have adopted from their neighbors, and Assyria has already overcome them. So in the eyes of the religious mind of that day, the false religions, yes, but in the mind, Assyria's gods were more powerful than the other idols set up. It's a lot of talking to say Assyria is saying, you're nothing. You don't even compare to the ones we've already overrun. They didn't get rid of the gods of the places. They kept them because it also kept those people from trying to revolt against them. Yes. Because they were still allowed to worship their own religions. Correct. They just pulled them in and said, our religion is more important than, than yours, but you can still worship your gods and idols. Yes. Did you hear the point? Basically, and this is true with Assyria, it's true with a lot of very successful conquering empires. When they conquered, they left the conquered people's gods, their religious structure, in place, in part because it helped keep the people in line. Especially as in many cases they integrated that religious structure as a subset of their larger religion. So, in Assyria, in Syria, and unfortunately, in both kingdoms of Israel, by this time, there are these small um, pantheons, these small hierarchies of these imaginary gods, and what the conqueror would do is simply slide that group of gods under the umbrella of their larger group of gods. Basically, they're building a religious corporate structure that keeps people in line. Very good point. But when you believe in all these gods, it's no, it's, I remember Michael talking 
like when he went to India. Yes. And he was trying to convert people. And he said, well, I could just add Jesus in as one of my gods, you know, because they couldn't comprehend one and only. Right. Because he used to so many. Yes. And see, you know, for us, I mean, even those of us who grew up outside the church, the, the idea of multiple gods is a really strange concept. Well, think about that from our perspective, then move over to the other side where it's an even stranger concept to think about just one. And when talking with someone from that perspective, when we say there is one God, and then we have to dig deeper and talk about Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we then throw some confusion back in. So that's just a, a side note. As we think, and especially as this area grows, and we find polytheistic faiths, that's a faith with more than one God, false gods, little g-gods. But as we find them and individuals willing to talk about faith, the idea of one God is going to be strange to some people. That's something to, to keep in mind as we talk and think about evangelism. Good point, Jay. Okay? All right, so part of this could be the workmanship of idols, but more likely it is their uh, perceived power based on the outcome of battles. All right? And then verse 11 continues the boast. As I have done to Samaria and her idols, shall I not do also to Jerusalem and her idols? So God uses heathen nations for his purposes. Ultimately, this is preparing the path for the Messiah. But now Assyria is saying, look at us. And it talks in the first person, look at me. And in a minute, we're going to see the me, I, me, I, me, I cycle that we can get caught up in. Look what I did. This was my idea. This was my work. I accomplished these things. I taught her that. Okay, we got to be careful. This is going to be a boast of enormous magnitude. Okay, but we've got to be careful not to get caught in the same kind of boasts. Exactly. Well, and you know, totally, there are a lot of paths we could take with this conversation. But when we look at that particular example, we see how denomination, denominationalism started seeping in really quickly. Well, you know, I like the way Paul preaches. Or I like, you know, the way Apollos ordered worship. And I'm making it up, obviously. They didn't say specifically why they considered themselves of one or the other. But it's sectarianism. That was true in Judah at the time we're talking about. Not only were they sectarian, they were sectarian under an imaginary group of little g gods. So idolatry mixed with division. Judah was in pretty bad shape at this point, if you hadn't figured that out. Chip? I don't know when 2 Kings 17 falls in, this Isaiah and stuff, but right as they were, right as they fell into um, Israel, um, was captured. Mm -hmm. I, I've always been intrigued with 2 Kings chapter 17 when I read it. A couple things that go on there is... <laughs> Syria actually brought back some of the priests to teach the, because God was destroying them to, to get the children to come back somewhat and then in that verse 33 it says talking about Israel they feared the Lord and served their own gods according to the custom of the nations from whom they had been carried away into exile and then the Lord said that the covenant I made with you shall forget the other gods, you shall, you shall not fear other gods, only me. They tried to share. They were doing the same thing as you just talked about some of the other nations, just adding more gods in. They had become to the point where, you know, they feared God, but they feared the other gods. Mm -hmm. um, it just kind of, as you're saying that, that just struck me back there as 
you know, I don't know, like I said, I'm not good on my timetables of when that happened, but, in, you know, in that second King's Falls, as far as Isaiah, I think, was prophesizing during that time. Mm -hmm. um, but it's just amazing. Just what you said is what they said there in second Kings, that they, they ended up fearing any other gods that they fell into exile with. And, you know, they just started sharing God with other gods. Yes. Little G. And one of the aspects that's most applicable for us in that kind of examination is an understanding of who is the author of confusion. Satan. Because what can happen to us today is we have a, a fervor for the word. And then somebody says, well, have you read the gospel of Judas? Now, luckily, not a lot of people have reacted to that phrase. You understand that there is supposedly religious literature that tries to compete with the scriptural gospels. The reason I bring that out is because we find today people that will look at these things, get wrapped up in them, and try to compare. Here's the problem. That is like, from the example that Chip just talked about, that is like trying to mix and follow a little G God with a little bit of the big G God. That's really dangerous. Why? Because of the confusion that it can generate. Because we can look at some of these so-called gospels and see, okay, you know, here's at least, and I'm going to be generous, 30% that is not horribly inaccurate or blasphemous. So that 30%, well, you know, it sounds pretty good. And it may be accurate. Because there are also false religions that sprung out of exposure to Judaism and the early church. So they will pick and choose pieces and mix them together. And especially if it's pure Judaism and pure 1st century, 2nd, 3rd century church, the church, it can sound very familiar when compared to the word the Word of God. So when we look at these things, sometimes the, the value is the overlay to us. When we see that confusion, we've got to stop, we've got to set aside anything that's not Scripture and say, okay, you know what, I want to be really strong in this before I consider where this may have come from. An example. Um, in our area... Um, there's a very large, active uh, organization that calls itself the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. What's the more common original term? The Mormons. Okay. So I bring that out to say this. I've read the Book of Mormon. And I have read the English translation of the Quran. That would have been unwise for me to do 30 years ago when I was an immature Christian. Because even then I knew the Quran is not scripture. Okay? But there's some things in the Quran that sound biblical. Where do you think the influence for those biblical passages came from? Came from Scripture. The exposure for those who wrote those down came from exposure to Scripture. Patrick? I've learned that, that almost every lie, if not every lie, contains at least a fragment of truth. Yes. And a lot of these false religions and antichrist, as they would be called in the Bible, they want to take that fragment of the truth I mean, they want to expand it to feel like it covers their whole text. Yes. When over 99% of it is completely horse hockey. <laughs> they just use that fragment to verify their lie. Well, we can, we can latch on to that fragment 
as Satan wants us to do so that the lies have an easier time seeping into the cracks. So, one second. The point about the Quran and the Book of Mormon is, you know what? Until we've got a really solid foundation in Scripture, we don't play with fire. We don't run the risk of mixing the two and inadvertently allowing ourselves to be deceived. So, when we look at how the nations had mixed gods together, we see, well, they picked a little bit of what was right, but they kept all that was wrong. And remember, sin is sin, regardless of its magnitude. Jay? Exactly. Right. And you shifted the whole meaning of everything. And with the Quran, you got this guy saying, hey, you can have a bunch of wives. The Bible saying you can have one wife. There's a big contradiction there. Exactly. You know, or I, I can't remember. It's Alpha, I want to say 214, but I can't quote you on that, where it says Jesus is going to be born in Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. It's a prophecy, not Bethlehem. I mean, that's an error. Yes. You can't have an error with this from God. Correct. Correct. And that's what we've got to, to recognize. Number one, until we're solid in our understanding of the Word of God and our commitment to seeking the truth, because there's a, an important aspect there, we stay away from the things that, that create confusion. Now, we need to grow to the point that we want enough knowledge to combat, and I say combat just in a general sense. I don't want to go out and start a fight with someone about faith. We talked about it Sunday morning. When we talk about truth, it shouldn't be something we have to scream at someone because then our heart's not in the right place and we're certainly not showing our audience the right attitude. If we talk about truth being gentle, peaceable, loving, we certainly don't want to be screaming on the street corner like we've lost our minds. Okay? I'm not getting as far as I wanted to tonight, but I, th I hope we're having a good conversation. All right, um, verse 12. Therefore, it shall come to pass when the Lord has performed all his work on Mount Zion and on Jerusalem, that he will say, I will punish the fruit of the arrogant heart of the king of Assyria and the glory of his haughty looks. You know, let's, let's keep going. Verse 13, for he says, this is talking about the king of Assyria, by the strength of my hand, I have done it, and by my wisdom, for I am prudent. Also, I have removed the boundaries of the people and have robbed their treasuries, so I have put down the inhabitants like a valiant man. My hand has found like a nest the riches of the people, and as one gathers the eggs that are left, I have gathered all the earth. And there was no one who moved his wing nor opened his mouth with even a peep. Notice the use of my and I. Assyria never had any intention of serving God Almighty. They are demonstrating the ultimate in pride. We are mighty because of us, because of me, because I did this. That's not going to turn out so well because God has said, I will punish the fruit of the arrogant heart of the king of Assyria and the glory of his haughty look. God also is going to ask a question in verse 15. Before we get that, any comments or questions about what we've talked about tonight? And that's not God. It was I and me left out God. Exactly. You know, I appreciate you bringing that out because obviously in that passage I just read, I added the emphasis. But I could almost hear a pagan, empire-loving king standing before his people saying, look at all that I have done. We have to be very careful because we can pursue what is right. And I'll just give you an example. We can pursue 
growth of this congregation in truth. And then we can claim the credit for it and be wrong for having done the whole thing at all. It is important to understand where the credit lies. Patrick? He speaks as a man of great power and no authority. Hmm. Yep. Because he didn't do any of it. Exactly. Except he's got the control to make a lot of things happen. Yes. You know, he's, he's got the armies. God allowed them to be successful because the people they were going against were termed as wicked, were identified for punishment. All right, we'll pick up on verse 15 of chapter 10 next time. Thank you. A seat. If you are visiting with us tonight, we are so glad to have you. Ask that you'd fill out a card on the back of the pew in front of you. We would uh, greatly appreciate that. We have a good number tonight. We appreciate everyone uh, being here. And welcome to those that are uh, on live stream as well. Uh, Debbie just told me that uh, the courts decided um, in their favor, her and Bentley, so she has permanent custody of Bentley, and um, she just said she wants to give God all the glory and appreciate everyone's prayers. Uh, Christy is home uh, sick tonight. Um, Marie Belzer is still recovering from her hip surgery. And uh, I talked to Stacy Grooms, and Michael uh, was in back surgery this afternoon. It was about 4 o'clock when I talked to her. It was about a two- or three-hour surgery on his back again, and they did some more plates and different things, and I don't have any updates on that as well, but um, she said she would let me know as soon as she could. So uh, be praying for uh, Michael's uh, speedy recovery and that the surgery went well. Um, also, this is an important announcement. Uh, Virgie, one of our members, um, she is originally from the Philippines and her son passed away with a heart attack. He was only 46 years old. And um, also her daughter has cancer and she is in the area here. So she is um, wanting to fly back uh, to the Philippines, which is pretty expensive. And she doesn't have um, all the money to be able to do that. So if you want to donate um, to that, just um, make your check out or make your check out to Boiling Springs and give it to one of the elders. And um, <clears throat> we will make sure she gets it and the congregation is um, planning on contributing as, as well. And keep her uh, in your prayer. It's a very difficult time for Virgie right now. Um, also, uh, we are going to have a Mother's Day breakfast on May the 11th. And there is a sign-up sheet if you are able to come uh, participate in the lobby. And also, uh, for the men that can assist uh, with the cooking and serving for that. It will be at 10.30 in the morning, kind of a brunch situation. Uh, and the, it should be in the bulletin as well, and Charles Lambert wanted me to make that announcement. Also, we got uh, this quarter's edition of the Spiritual Sword, and it is on prayer. And Bob reminded me uh, with us having our prayer service the last day, uh, the last Sunday of every month. This could be very helpful in that, and um, I have not read it yet, um, plan to, and Bob said it is excellent. So there are copies of this in the foyer here if you want to pick one up. If you would, um, Billy has our Devo tonight, and Philip our singing. Will you please stand for our first song? There is power, power in the blood of the Lamb. Would you do service for your Lord? I like that song. Would you do service for your Lord? That's a great question. Tonight I am once again thankful to God first and foremost who has blessed me in every way as he has you. And I am so delighted to be at home on Wednesdays that I don't know what to do. 
Sometimes I'm standing in the corner as if I forgot what it was I was doing. But I thank him for the opportunity to remind me that there are things that still need to be done in the process of preparing his people while they're preparing to do his work on a daily basis, Wednesdays and Sundays. Not only Wednesdays and Sundays, but every day of our lives. So tonight, we're going to have a small lesson. And Brother Bob reminded me that we only have a limited time. He reminded me he's still on his job. But I want you to bear with me tonight because this is very important to me. Most, most of the time, most congregations don't like crying preachers. I'm going to try my best not to do that. But it's something about being at home. Boiling Springs will always be forever my home. Without any further ado on my behalf, tonight our banner is going to be investing in the Lord. Our banner is going to be investing in the Lord. And I want you to come and go with me as we glorify our God tonight. Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse number 21. I want you to listen to the Bible. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 21. Make you complete in every every good work to do his will, working in you. What is well-pleasing in his sight through Jesus, to him be the glory and forever. That verse is something that I want to talk about tonight. Christians should do the Lord's will. I said Christians should do the Lord's will. I'm reminded on um, two and a half years ago, praise the Lord, he has allowed me to live this long, to see this night. I am totally not excited about it. But I am excited about the growth of Boiling Springs Church of Christ. And it is amazing when you go other places what you see. You miss the unity of what you're accustomed to. But it all belongs to God. Two and a half years ago, if I'm not mistaken, Alton Kelly stood up on a Wednesday night. And he inducted me into the Hall of Fame. He did. God blessed him with that message. And the message that he spoke that night, I know for a fact it was God, because when he handed the key to me, everything I touched was the Lord. We're not going to be like those folks in Isaiah. Everything I touched, it was the Lord. Whenever I asked the brethren to do a particular job, work, very rarely if one, I got a no. It wasn't me. It was God. You brethren have worked so generously, continuously to help me and the elders, first of all, God and first, first and foremost, to make things run as well as they should. And I am excited about that because not only that, it has allowed me to grow in various different ways. I, I began to know my brothers and sisters in Christ. I know every one of the guy's names. Ask Brother Marshall, he can tell you. I know who they are. I know what they are capable of. I can't police them, but I know their hearts. 
Whenever they were asked to do something, they were willing to do the work of the Lord. To me, that's a great impact on all of us. And I've learned so much. They were brothering doing things that they've never done before. Doing the Lord's Supper table. Those who were leading songs like Brother Robbie was supposed to lead tonight. I was looking forward to that, but he's only in the month now. Growth. Uh, I remember Brother Martin, when he first came here, I asked him would he be willing to come up and do a Devo. That changed all of our lives, I believe. God had a plan. So in saying that, Brother Alton, I want to thank you for all that you were able to help me with. I want to thank Elder Joe Mabry for the opportunity to, to allow you to do that. And you, brethren, has, has been totally awesome to me. But not only to me, first and foremost, you've been awesome to God. And he's taken account for that. He's, he's written in his, in his book everything you've ever done for the cause of Christ. There are others whom I could call names, Brother Chris, Elder Jay, Elder Tim, who is not an elder anymore. There's one thing I remember. He said, Billy, he said, these guys are not on the clock. He said, they are volunteering. They, they, they volunteer to do this. You don't have to push them. I never pushed a soul. Never. I gave you guys my honest heart. First and foremost, I gave it to God. And I give it to God at this point. And I want you to know, because I'm not here, Everything that I do and touch is about the Lord. And it reflects me first. You say, well, what? Oh, it breaks me down every time I read a passage of scripture. <coughs> and it has allowed, has allowed me to grow, to be better than I was before. In order to do what I do, I must walk right. I must talk right. I must study right. I must live right. And when I fall, I must get up and wipe it off and pray to God that he forgive me, that I can keep moving forward. The Lord is bringing you, brethren, you have been totally wonderful and awesome to God. And I want to thank your wives for doing the same. Because if it weren't for them pushing you, reminding you what you have on Sunday morning to do. God is sitting on the throne, he's watching us, and he knows what we're able and what we're capable of doing. And if you don't do it, <coughs> something is wrong. I remember over there in Isaiah chapter 5, Isaiah was not Isaiah as he is now in the Bible. He's still talking to us. And Isaiah said, he said, I'm not worth it. But at the end of that first chapter, he says, here I am, Lord, send me. Who am I going to send? Isaiah said, send me. Well, you, you brethren, the Lord has sent you in some areas here for the spring, but I'll tell you right now, it has made my life comfortable. On Sunday morning, I'm usually texting folks early in the morning, usually on Saturday nights. I'm preparing to make sure everything's ready so God knows that we're ready and our elders know that we're ready, ready, ready. What a challenge. And I'm excited about it. I'm hollering at the preacher now. Can y'all hear I'm shouting at the preacher. But I've been preaching all my life ever since I was a little bitty boy. I sit in the pews and watch my father preach day after day, Sunday after Sunday. Watching him, I've been preaching all my life. I'm not going to do that. But I'm like Isaiah. Who are you going to see? Born and strange to Christ. Who's going to come and step up to do what's necessary? We have a new fella in line now, Brother Mitchell White. And I'm praying that you all will give him the honor that you gave him. Work with him in every way. Because he's young. Praise the Lord, he's going to be an elder one day, perhaps. A deacon one day, maybe. 
I don't know what it's going to be. God has a plan for all of us. But for him at this point, work with him. Strengthen him. Build him up in every way. Work with him. <coughs> and while, he, while, while we're working with him, God's going to work with you. So for that, my new time is up, Brother Bob. But I got a few more minutes. <laughs> because you all are not going to see me anymore after this after tonight. Next Sunday, I'll be able to speak. And I want more strength in God to know that when I am there, I give them my very best. Now it is them, first and foremost, I am preaching to the Almighty God. <clears throat> and that's a tall task. Now, here's the lesson. Enoch in, in Genesis chapter 5 and verse 22 and 23. Notice, he began in Genesis and he begot Methuselah. Enoch walked with God for 300 years. You're not going to do that, but he walked with Enoch 300 years. And he had sons and daughters. Brethren, you have sons and daughters. If you're not ready, you should be getting ready to serve and worship God in a way that's pleasing and acceptable in his sight. Not only that, Noah worked, it's in your Bible, Noah worked for God. Brethren, God will not settle just for a part of us. We must surrender all to him without holding anything back. Brethren, to walk with the Lord, we must seek to please him. In my studies, I love the word him because that's who it's about, him. We must partake of his word and continue in the spirit in prayer at all times. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 17. In other words, this verse is saying, pray without ceasing. For every one of you, every one of us, but those whom you serve with on Sunday mornings, on Wednesdays, and day-to-day -day basis, we need to pray. For every, every individual, we need to pray for them. Brethren, we must invest in the Lord. Matthew chapter 6 and verse number 20. But lay up for yourselves, not treasures here on earth, but in heaven. In heaven. Notice, to do the will of God, we must give it all to him first place. Not only that, we must give him our affection. Notice God's word admonishes us to be brethren. Watch the text in Matthew 6, 33. He says, seek ye what? The first. Seek ye what? First. The kingdom of God and his, and his, and my, no, and his, and my, and your, no, and his righteousness. What, what will he do? It'll, he'll add all these things to you. Brethren, over there in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 2, listen to the Bible. He says, therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witness, let us lay aside every weight of sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Jesus is the author and the finisher of our faith. For whom the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the same 
as has, he has set down on the right hand side of the throne of God. Let me tell you, that's a savior worth serving. And that is God at his best. Let me tell you, that's God at his best. You want to see God at his best? Become a Christian. You want to see God at his best? Live like a Christian. I'm not going to get any amens. That's okay. But if you want to, you want to know who God really is, live as a Christian. Amen. Live like you love him. Brethren, these things, I promise you, if you do these things, you are going to see things God has never done in your whole life. When we come to worship, we come to worship, brethren. We come to worship. Notice what is it worth. What is it worth to you? What's it worth to you? Is it worth, I want to go home real quick, I need to get out of here, I got to go home, I need to go home. What is it worth to you? He's a God, a mighty God worth serving. What is he worth to you? He ought to be worth everything. Falling Springs deserves only the best. Wherever God has his kingdom to be worshipped, served, visited, need to be the best. If it's in China, if it's in Texas, it need to be the best. And that means we need to give him our honor. Give him your best. What is it worth to you? To all the brethren at Boiling Springs, the task which was given to me by our elders through God and Brother Alton Kelly and through the wonderful brethren in Christ, so loving and so kind and so caring, I want you to keep your eyes on the prize and willing to continue to seek the kingdom first. I truly love my family, my entire family at Boiling Springs. To the wives of these brethren, keep loving them. Keep loving them for the rest of their lives. While they work, while they work in the kingdom of God. Brethren, keep maximizing your potential. In closing, maximize your potential. That means if you are carrying the basket on Sunday morning, the tray on Sunday morning to pick up our collection, his collection, keep maximizing your potential. You need to become a song director. You need to become a Wednesday night <coughs> prayer warrior. You need to become something for the king. And everyone you meet on the street, you need to let them know about the master that we serve. He's wonderful. And there are folks out there that really want to know about God. Y'all didn't know that, did If you ask them a question, they'll know. They're like, I really want to know about God. But if you never ask, what happens? Nothing. We have a job to do. And God is going to hold us accountable for everything that we are doing and not doing. <coughs> we must give an account for the deeds, whether they were good or bad, while in these bodies, it's in your body. Keep working for the kids. Remind the family members that they need to become members of the body of Christ. Because one day he's going to come, we don't know who. Could be now, could be tomorrow. While maximizing your potential, I want you to take Brother White, pray about it first, take Brother Mitchell White, 
and love him with all your heart. And Brother Mitchell, if you're looking by virtual, maybe, maybe not, these brethren will work with you in every way. All of our brethren will work with you, Brother Mitchell, in every way. And the Lord, and the Lord God I serve is going to make sure that happens. Keep blessing us in a way that's pleasing to God. And bless Brother Mitchell by being thoughtful and kind to him to help him maneuver through this new transition. He's going to need all the help he can get. Boiling Springs, I don't know where you are tonight, but we need to keep letting God have his way. Perhaps you're here tonight and you have not obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ. We know that you must hear if you're willing. You must believe if you're willing. You must repent of your sins if you're willing. You must confess your sins, your faults, if you're willing. And you must be baptized if you're willing to go down in the water grave of baptism and become a new Christian, a new walk in life, to become that new man and woman that you can go tell your friends, I've done one of the greatest things in the world. I became a Christian. Perhaps you're an erring Christian. You have not been following God's rules. We want to pray that you get up and come forward as we together stand. You have blessed us so richly. <clears throat> We're thankful for Brother Billy, what he means to this congregation, and pray that you would bless him. Um, during his time, he's been helping Edgewood, that they may be able to grow to serve you better in that area. Thankful for his willingness to do that. And um, it's always good to have him here, uh, any chance that he, he gets. Thankful for Brother Barry and his, um, his positive outlook. Pray that you would bless him and Jessica and their family as he looks for his new job, that it will work out if it be your will. We're thankful for everyone here at Boiling Springs and the contributions they make. And uh, you have just uh, blessed us beyond measure. Thankful for Martin, for Marshall, and what they've added to this congregation. We pray that you would bless them in every way and help us to help them in every way. Be with us as we go our separate ways, and uh, please let our light shine this week. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>